Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, for joining us. Uh, we are about to have a conversation about something that is, I know, on so many of your minds, uh, about the economy and where we really are and where we're really headed and what is actually happening uh, today and what may or may not happen tomorrow. And I know we are at a moment that feels so very, very uncertain, but we're with two people who I think uh, might provide some semblance of certainty or at least uh, help us try to get to something uh, that's a little bit closer to that. Um, these two um, are in the midst of it, right in the midst of it, and I think uh, we'll have a better sense of it and be able to help us in ways that are unimaginable. Charlie Scharf is here. He's the CEO of Wells Fargo. He has been the CEO since 2019. Uh, he's a member of the board of Microsoft, uh, former CEO of Bank of New York Mellon, uh, former CEO of uh, Visa, and we've known each other, I think, and I've covered you uh, back in your days at J.P. Morgan as one of the great, uh, can we call him, your, your protege of? Of Jamie Dimon, they, they put you in that category. I call him a friend. You call him a friend. Um, Roger Ferguson is here. Uh, Roger uh, was a former, vice, uh, a former Federal uh, Reserve Vice Chair, uh, former CEO and President of TIAA. Uh, he is now a member of the Council on Foreign Relations uh, and is uh, doing so many things that we need to talk about. Uh, but I, here's where I want to start the conversation. Um, this morning, President Biden laid out his uh, Bidenomics program, and at the same time, uh, across, uh, the, across, across the ocean, really, uh, Jay Powell was speaking about uh, inflation and, and interest rates. And I just want to, I want to start with both of you there, because I think we're all trying to understand where in the cycle, if you will, we really are. Everybody's asked the question, are we headed for a recession? Is this about to get better? How much worse is it going to get? So I've just, just a level set for the room. Where do you think we really are, Roger? All right, so first, uh, pleasure to be here and, and great to be with Charlie as well as you, Andrew, as always. So where are we? We are in an economy that has many different components and therefore it's hard to say one broad thing. So let's start with where are we. There's some parts of the economy that are doing incredibly well. Um, if you are an AI-driven company right now, your equity is up, people are excited to be near, around you, et cetera. Uh, frankly, a number of consumer goods companies continue to do quite well. If you look at the other side, there's some companies where things are just very challenging and flat. Um, there are sectors that are quasi or near something that feels like a recession. So housing is really uneven. Commercial real estate feels probably pretty problematic. problematic. So the reason that many people are questioning where are we is we are, depending on where you sit, in lots of good or bad places. Point two, where are we? We are at the Federal Reserve in the process of normalizing interest rates. For many people, um, and some people in this room, many people in society, they've never actually seen a Fed on the path towards raising rates because we have been in a period of massive disinflation literally since the 1990s. So we are, the Fed is in the process of raising rates to get ahead of an inflation that seems relatively intractable. I think they, they have, I think, signaled possibly two uh, rate increases. The market's expecting that. I actually think the Fed's likely to do more than two rate increases. So we're not yet done with something that's unusual for lots of people, which is the Fed fighting inflation. Finally, where are we with the Biden economic story? Um, I would think there, that is a multi-year story that's going to play out. Um, most of what they're doing has been driven by long-term views about the need to invest in, in ships manufacturing here and in infrastructure. So where are they? They're going to be out telling a story that actually is a multi-year story. So the reason it's uncertain is because, indeed, it's uncertain. You want to take a stab at it? Sure. You have a different view? Uh, I, no, no I, I don't have a different view. What I would add to it is um, that uh, there are significant differences uh, depending on who you're talking to and where, you are, and where you are in this economy. The consumer is still incredibly strong on average. Um, and I would say when you look at, when we break apart the consumer population and look at all wealth deciles, uh, most, the majority, are still doing extremely well when you look at how much money they have in their bank accounts, when you look at what they're spending. Um, but there are some who are towards the bottom of the wealth spectrum who are doing worse than they were pre-pandemic, and we shouldn't forget that. But overall, when you look at what's driving the predominance of the economy, 
uh, the strength just continues month after month. And you don't see, I mean, you have access literally to people's checking accounts, so you know what the numbers are. You, you don't see, <laughs> no, you don't see that by the end of this year, and there's a number of people who have said this aloud, including Seth Klarman of Baupost, who's uh, one of the great investors of our time, Warren Buffett has uh, praised him many times, who, who believe that by the end of 23 into 24, that he thinks there's going to be a lot of members of this society in America that won't have the cash in their in their checking accounts anymore. Yeah, well, I, well, I th well, the two separate things, right? One is one is where do we stand today, and why is there this difference in perceptions? And there's this difference in perception because consumers are doing extremely well for the most part, but then you've got different businesses that you know, depending on where you are, how inflation's impacting you, commercial real estate. Um, you've got, there's no question, the Fed raising rates like this is something most people have never seen. Most people don't understand how hard it is to tame inflation and what that's going to take and what, uh, and, and, and what an, you know, an economy without free money looks like. That's just very different. So it's very confusing to people. Having said that, I am worried. There's no question about that. When you look at all of these impacts uh, that, these, that, that the rate increases have and the continued inflation that we see, um, there's only so much that consumers can take. And so when we look at our credit metrics, uh, they're still extraordinarily strong, but they're deteriorating very slowly, right. week after week, month after month. Now, as long as it stays orderly, that's not the worst thing in the world because people have to adjust to a m more normalized environment. Um, but there, th that's a very, very hard thing to do. Are you shocked at the continuation of spending it, it often feels that we are, we are living in what might be described as a, a YOLO summer, and maybe it's a, a, you know, a, a post-pandemic spending habit. But you look at travel, you look at some of the services and restaurants and things like that, and, and it just seems like it's, it's continuing unabated. But again, people have money. You know, people have jobs. People have wage increases. And so they're spending what they have. Just let me pick up on Charlie's point from a macro standpoint. He's absolutely right, right? So we've heard the Fed talk about something like 1.7 job openings for every unemployed person. The unemployment rate, though it has creeped up, crept up a little bit, is remarkably low. People have jobs. People are getting, you know, pretty good wage increases after a period when they weren't. Um, I think Charlie's also right from a macro standpoint. A fair amount of money has been put into people's uh, wallets. So we shouldn't be stunned uh, or even surprised. We should, in fact, be celebrating that consumers appear to be resilient. And I think Charlie's right. Over time, that's going to wear. And, you know, we haven't seen, uh, you know, it's said in monetary policy that money, the policy works with long and variable lags. Long and variable lags is meant to be several quarters. The Fed really just got started on this. So I don't think we've seen yet the full impact of, the rate hikes already out there and more to come. Does that mean that you do expect a recession then? Well, as I've said to you a yeah. few times, I, I have long been in the camp that a recession is more likely than not. And is that a year out? It may be a year out. You know, I, I mean, I think what everyone's been surprised by the ongoing resilience, which is a positive thing. The reason I think recession is more likely than not, and by the way, I should quickly add a short and shallow recession, not a you know 2000 you know, a kind of recession, is history, frankly. Um, in the 10 or 12 times the Fed has attempted to engineer a soft landing uh, by raising rates, they generally have not succeeded. That is because the tool is very blunt. It's hard to get inflation out of the system. And you don't know uh, the tipping point. And so I think a recession of a short and shallow type is more likely than not. Um, but let's hope I'm proven wrong. Let me, let me ask you about this. This is Biden, uh, by the way, earlier today, uh, by the way, agreeing in large part with you. He says there's still a fair amount of cash in deposit accounts. Consumer spending is holding up. Debit card spending flattish. Credit card spending up roughly 10 percent and slowly, uh, as expected, not seeing any meaningful declines. But Greg Ip, talking about Bidenomics in The Wall Street Journal this morning, says all of this great record that uh, the Biden administration may be touting. He says, the record, though, is overshadowed by the record of his first months in office when the American Rescue Plan pumped $1.9 trillion of demand into a supply-constrained economy. The result, the tightest job market in memory and a surge in inflation that still hangs over the Biden approval rating and his prospects for re-election. I raise this because here we are talking about potential recession. You'd be talking about that in a year. We're all thinking a little bit about the election cycle. What does this portend, and, and is Greg Ip right? Meaning, do you hold the administration responsible 
for some, I mean, we can hold the Fed, I think, a lot responsible for, uh, for a lot of the inflation, but you hold the administration responsible for at least some of it. So um, I'll go first, and then because you're sort of asking me to point fingers at my former friend or friends and former colleagues. Um, and so, look, I think there are three things that are driving this inflation. Um, one, I do think the Fed was a little slow at focusing on this issue, got into the debate of temporary, transitory, permanent, et cetera. Secondly, this is a global phenomenon, or has been, uh, being driven by supply chain disruptions, the war leading to energy and food, so let's not ignore that. I think Greg is certainly right. All of the mathematics of you know, how deep the recession was versus how much stimulus the administration put in suggest, yes, probably too much. Having said that, we've got to be careful because you know, all of the spending didn't exactly happen at one point. It's still driving the economy forward, which is a thankful thing. We've avoided recession because of some of this. And so I'd say if I were pointing out the order in which I'd look at this, Fed being a little late to the party because it's the Fed's job to maintain inflation under control, supply shocks that are always hard for any central bank to manage, and a fiscal policy that certainly was stimulative but has the dual effect of allowing us to sit here two plus years on and still say, well, the economy's in pretty good shape. So I can imagine him you know, running on that record, though it is a checkered record. What do you say? Well, I'm certainly not going to uh, draw judgments on an administration that regulates us. That would not be a smart thing to do. <laughs> um, but uh, and, uh, seriously, I, I honestly, and I, I think this is honestly true, I think it's really, really hard to sit here today and make these judgments, right? There is, I mean, it's, again, I think about the job that I, this, I've always thought this in my career. When you get a job, you always have to be really careful about being so critical about the people that came before you and the things that you saw. You weren't sitting there. You didn't know all the things that were going on around you. All the things that happened after that, you know, this hindsight really is 2020. And so the reality is, Yes, there was too much money that was pumped into the economy. Was it one party? No. Was it both parties? Yes. Did, should it have continued? Probably not. Should the Fed have moved sooner? Absolutely. Um, but again, there were lots of reasons why that, that those decisions were taken at the time. So to me, the question now is just are we all aligned, uh, both in terms of fiscal and monetary policy, to deal with the issue that has to get dealt with? And that's what it comes back to. You know, we, you know people talk about this almost like it's theoretical. Inflation isn't theoretical. Inflation impacts people in a very, very real way, and, it, and, and, and its negative effect just grows potentially exponentially, especially for those that have less money over time. But one of the reasons I ask you about the administration is because there, there's, there's two sides of this. There, there's one side where you could look and say, look, the CHIPS Act, um, some of the things they're doing on, on climate. There, there's a big industrial policy uh, in place that is pushing, hopefully in the right way, uh, some in, in, innovations and entrepreneurship and investment. And I think we, some people can debate that. Um, on the other side, uh, you could argue that regulations have, have become much tighter. Um, whether you think that is uh, affecting capital allocation and the like, and sort of trying to assess what this administration has done and what this administration may do. So the answer to the question is yes, which is, you know, no, it, it, it's sort of humorous, but it's also true. So yes, they actually are putting into place a long-term industrial policy that focuses on a number of things that many people think to be dealt with. You know, manufacturing more chips here in the U.S. Natural security reason, but also it supports our technology sector in which we are clearly the leader. Yes, we probably do need to invest in infrastructure. Well, you've had a, a massive axe or massive collapse on Route 95. I mean, it's, this is not the sign of a healthy economy if, or society if we aren't investing in infrastructure. I think we need to invest more in education. All that's true. Clearly, um, there are, you know, in the, the Democratic Party, a, a process towards tightening regulations after what many people would have thought was maybe a loosening, and so the pendulum is swinging back and forth. When you get to fiscal monetary, fiscal policy, regulatory policy, monetary policy, by definition, you're in the area of judgments that are based on incomplete facts and models that don't always work. You are clearly driving um, a little bit of an ideological view of how best to 
move the economy forward, so we shouldn't be surprised when Democrats get into poli in the, in the office. They're more likely to use the tools of fiscal spending as opposed to tax cuts. And so I think the, what, particularly for this audience, a recognition of the complexity, as Charlie said, the ambiguity does exist, and it's going to be impossible to make a simple yay, nay, good, bad judgment because by definition these things are complex. And the final point is, particularly when it comes to making investments in our society, it takes decades to figure it out. If one goes back and looks at the history of Eisenhower wanting to build the interstate highway system, massively controversial. Hard to imagine you know, a Republican would be that profligate. It proves to have been one of the most important things that he, that he could have done. And so, to Charlie's point, you know, judging these long-term investments in a short-term, quarter-to-quarter lens doesn't really work. Charlie, let me... Let me do, you, do you want to comment on that? The only thing I was going to add I, uh, to what Roger said was, the other thing which I think you've got to be a little careful about is, um, when we just think about the money that was spent, the way I heard the question was almost policy first, and then we'll determine the overall size, and then what else should it be. And I'm not sure, in retrospect, that's how it was actually done. So I think there are some very smart uses of some of that money. The things you pointed out absolutely should be done. Are they part of a broader comprehensive plan that was thought up in the beginning? Um, and are we done? Is that it? Or is the, is, the money go, is, is the rest of the money going to the right things or the wrong things? And that's what I think we've got to be a little careful about. Um, let me ask you a, a question about something that I think is concerning to a lot of folks, and specifically in the financial world, which is there is a worry. If you talk to a lot of bankers, uh, they say if a recession is coming, uh, the, the tipping point or inflection point could very well be commercial real estate. Um, that there are lots of regional banks around the country that are exposed to commercial real estate, especially office. Uh, so many of us are living hybrid lives and, and the like. Um, your, your company, founded in San Francisco, uh, is a city that is uh, challenged, I think we could say politely. What do you think happens with commercial real estate, and what do you therefore think happens to banks, and therefore what do you think happens to the broader economy? Yeah, well, I would start with the banks. Uh, you know, the banks are, when, when talking about the industry broadly, the banks are in great shape certainly relative to where they were in 2008. I mean, the banking system is completely different today than it was 10 or 15 years ago. For the big banks, capital levels are double what they were. I mean, double. When you, and when you look at the standards in, to which we underwrite loans today of all types, completely different, all the horrible lessons that had, unfortunately, you know, were learned going through uh, uh, the financial crisis, have completely changed how and what banks do. Um, and there's just a tremendous amount of the risky type of things that we do, which are now done outside of the banking system. So, you know, when you look at the risk that sits in the banking industry relative to the capital, it's completely different. Um, now, so what is that? So I think overall, the banks will do just fine. The other thing which, you know, you have to remember is... Um, uh, real estate's going to play out over, over, over a multi-year period of time. Um, banks are still earning plenty of money. And it doesn't mean that there won't be an individual bank that has too much exposure in whatever area they're in. But when you look, especially when you talk about the regional banks, regional banks have broad-based businesses. You know, it's not commercial real estate. Office is just one thing they do, right? It's, it's not size generally in a way uh, that should bring about the fear that you're describing. Let me just follow up, though, because there's, there's a separate issue, I think, and we can talk about some of the broader real estate issues that are, that are happening across the country. But I think we saw in the context of the failure of Silicon Valley Bank something very interesting happen. And we can take away, I think when you strip it down, you get to this idea of how is it possible that effectively tens of billions of dollars could flee and leave a bank in the course not of days or weeks the way it might have been in the old days when people would have to line up at the teller, but that it happens in hours. That you get your phone out, right. you bang, 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 people send some notes to each other on Twitter, and everybody's out of the pool all at one time. And in a digital world, how a banking system, based on trust and the idea that the money is going to be there, can still be there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um... There's no doubt that 
uh, the digital tools that are available today, whether it's your phone or just being able to go online or do something, um, allows money to move much more quickly than it ever did. Um, I'm not sure in the end that that changes the total amount of money that moves. So when we think about liquid, I mean, think about our own institution, when we think about, you know, what we have to prepare for, we might have thought that we would have three or four days to deal with something. Today, now we look at it and say, you know, it's one day. And so it becomes more of an operational issue of how you put yourself in a position to create liquidity. The issue with Silicon Valley Bank and uh, First Republic, it was a business model issue. That, they, those two institutions did not look like the broader banking system. Okay? There was not a reason why people left money at those institutions other than they had another relationship with them and they asked them to or they were being paid a higher rate for it. That is very, very different from the, a broader banking institution like ours or regional banks or even many local banks where you have people's transaction accounts, you have businesses' operating accounts, you have their payroll accounts. They're not going to go in and move that in any one way. And by the way, to set up a new bank account someplace with all the AML and KYC stuff that's required, that takes weeks today. So I think there's, you know, you've got to separate out the business model that, that's issue. No, that's know your customer moves. and anti-money laundering. Correct. Um, just to bring everybody up to speed. So I, I think I certainly would generally just generally agree with what Charlie had to say about the particular problems. I think certainly his statement about the banking system overall is, is completely accurate. Where I think I'd have a slight disagreement, and this may be the former regulator and Fed governor and me, is the notion that money could move that quickly was not contemplated before. And you know, our regulatory schemes, um, the ability of, of the, the, the FDIC, the Fed, the Treasury to act in a matter of a day or two is just not, it's not built into any of the lessons that one learns, right? If you think about the sweep of American history when it comes to banking and bank failures, continental Illinois took quite a while. It was the last really big failure. 1984. 1984. First, two, first bank described on the floor of Congress as too big to fail. It's too big to fail. And, and that drove a lot of the thinking about how we deal with these issues. The FDIC is thinking through, and the government is thinking through FDIC insurance. $250,000 seemed like a lot at one point, and then you suddenly realize, hmm, is that actually enough? And, it, and it's a debate, so how far should we go? So I agree with everything that Charlie said, ex except for the fact that I think from a systemic standpoint, the ability to move such large amounts of money in literally, as you point out, nanoseconds, um, requires some rethinking. I'm not sure what the outcome is going to be. What do you think that means? That. Do you think that we need to require that all deposits, everybody's money that's in this room that's sitting at a bank right now, should be guaranteed um, explicitly by the government? Right now it is potentially guaranteed implicitly, but it hasn't been tested. Yeah, I, so I would just say, I mean, I, you, could, you could approach it two ways. You could approach it by, and I think the answer is going to be a mix of both, but... One is, what do you do on the deposit side to make people feel more comfortable with their deposits that are uninsured? And the second is, um, what do you do on the liquidity side for banks where you look at the assets of banks and say, even if those runs happen, the bank should have enough liquidity to survive that? That, that is what... I mean, that, and, and that's what we live under, you know, and the biggest banks have these liquidity ratios that we have to operate under that aren't passed down to other banks in terms of what the requirements are, or when they get passed down, they're passed down with a different set of restrictions under the theory that the money would actually stay at those banks longer for, uh, for, uh, for different reasons. So I think there are, so I, I, I agree with Roger that times are different, but I think that you know, for those that have always thought about liquidity, that have thought they would have to deal with the issue, the issue is you might have to deal with it in a day or two as opposed to a much longer period of time. And so how do you put yourself in a position to be able to access the liquidity so you can give customers liquidity? And the reality is people like SVB did not have those things in place. Let me ask you, Charlie, a separate question about being a CEO in America today. Um, so, many, so many CEOs would come to frankly, this event and so many others over the last several years. And the big conversation was around ESG, environmental, social, and governance. We talked about climate. We talked about DEI issues. We talked about uh, uh, purpose over profit, in fact. 
uh, at some, uh, to some degree. And, and it feels over the past year um, that things are shifting again, once again, but are shifting back. Some people here might call that backwards. I'm curious what you think is happening. Um, and given all of the pledges that both Wells Fargo has made on various different uh, ESG sort of metrics and, and many of your clients have made, um, where do you think this all goes? Yeah, I, um, I, don't, I personally do not think backwards is where we're going. Um, but I do think there is uh, um, there's a balance in the conversation um, that didn't exist before. And uh, balance is always a helpful thing. And so what I mean by that is there was, um, and I could just speak from a company standpoint in terms of what do we do? What is, what is our responsibility? We absolutely believe we have a broader responsibility uh, than just making money. In fact, we believe that in order to maximize the value for shareholders, you have to think about all the other stakeholders. And I can go through why, I mean, Wells Fargo is a perfect example of that. Right? We made plenty of money. We did a bunch of other things we shouldn't have done. We weren't thinking about a bunch of stakeholders. And who got harmed? The shareholders. So they all do fit together. And all of the things related to ESG are very much a part of that. So there's no question in my mind that the push towards um, a broader society and companies recognizing their responsibility in ESG was incredibly important, and it wasn't happening. But we also have to realize that uh, we've got to be realistic about what it's going to take to get there, that no one industry can do it on their own. It would be incredibly helpful if public policy was aligned with what we wanted from the private sector as well. Um, uh, and so I think that, from, from my standpoint, it feels right. like that's where we are. But we're not going backwards. Right. We're still going but forwards. But on the public policy piece, I would argue to you that the reason why uh, the conversation has shifted, and Larry Fink said it shifted, one of the great pioneers of sort of ESG over the last decade, writing letters to CEOs like both of you uh, about sort of thinking about the, these uh, per, uh, sort of a larger mission, is you've seen what's happened in Florida with uh, Disney and DeSantis. Even in the past couple of weeks around companies, including Starbucks and others, who've decided not to be as... Um, aggressive in some of their, their uh, celebrations of, of Pride Month, for example. Uh, there are so many different issues that have, have taken place where, where companies that were quite outspoken on these issues have sort of receded. Um, issues on climate. If you, if, if, if you have certain climate policies, there are certain states in, in this country that don't want to do business with you. If you have policies around uh, uh, guns and, and whether you will uh, you know, loan money to gun manufacturers, if you won't, there are certain states that have decided they won't do business with you. How are you navigating that and recognizing that there is a policy issue, but there's also, given at least it was, it was put in moral terms uh, several years ago, how, how those two things square now? Listen, I would just, I, I, I think there are, um, I think the way, to, the way at least it feels is that, and this is true in any issue, by the way, whether it's ESG or anything else, there are always extremes that will weaponize something, okay? And we've seen that. And I don't, so absolutely you're right. Some of the things that we see in some states I think are incredibly unhelpful. I don't think they're appropriate, fair, uh, uh, or things like that. Um, but it is what it is. And the question is what are, go back to what we're going to do as a company and what I think other companies are going to do, which is we are still looking towards the future, and we're just dealing with the reality of whether it is climate, where things need to change, okay? It's going to take investment, a lot of support um, of the private sector and the public sector to get there, but that, I don't feel any differently about our commitment to that today than I did two years ago, um, and related to the, whether it's the governance pieces or the social issues of what our responsibilities are, none of that is different. And so we have to continue to have the courage to continue to move forward in a way that we th makes, think makes sense, knowing that there's always going to be noise in the periphery. So, look, I'd agree with Charlie on uh, everything you said. I would add a couple other facts. One is, is with respect to ES and G in particular, if one thinks about some of the biggest corporate failures we've had in the U.S. or around the world, it is failures in those three areas. 
So I think boards and CEOs have to think about the ESG question plus others as a range of risk topics that they have to manage either very, very tightly, hopefully in most cases, some cases maybe a little less so. Secondly, um, as a person who was, uh, most of you may not know, TIAA is, is a very large asset management business, among other things. And so having thought about this ESG topic from the standpoint of being an investor, I think it is a risk factor that one has to be paid for if you're going to invest money. So if you're investing in a company that has a high uh, risky ESG kind of profile, are you getting a sufficient return? And importantly, I think shareholders should do what they are doing, which is engage with management to figure out, well, how is, managing, how is the management team of any company that's in my portfolio going to manage down the ESG risk or any other risk to a point that is, that is manageable and tolerable? Third point I'd make, again, having been, I was a CEO of TIA. We had a large, have a large operation in Charlotte. Uh, one of the first places where, you know, all of this came to head, ahead was around transgender bathroom issues. And a number of CEOs signed a letter to the governor. I chose a different approach, calling him directly, sharing my points of view, et cetera. I will tell you, for some people in the company, it was absolutely the right thing to do. For some people in the company, it was absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, to Charlie's point, the job of the CEO is to manage all of these intersecting forces. But importantly, I think, to have a set of guiding principles that allow you to consistently and transparently respond to these issues. Um, and so, you know, my experience from being in the CEO seat was if I could articulate the points at which I'm going to engage and the points at which I'm not and why that's the case and do it consistently, at least people would say, okay, he's being true and honest to his principles. I may agree or disagree, but he's predictable. Um, and so I think there are some paths forward here, but, you know, it is a tough, tough situation. Well, let me ask you, I mean, there's an argument to be made that uh, the, the left, if you will, uh, long uh, used business and money uh, for political purposes. Um, and some people would argue weaponized, uh, weaponized these things. And for a very long time, Republicans actually did very little with, the, with, with these issues because their argument was it's a free market. And now, uh, you know, Larry Fink and others, and, and may, maybe yourself, are turning around and saying, well, look, it's now being weaponized on the right. Which is it? Or, or, and is, is it political? And by the way, uh, contextually, so much, of, so much of ESG actually started in Europe uh, which, which I also think uh, some people would suggest, therefore, is more aligned, frankly, uh, with, 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 with the liberal uh, part of uh, America than the more conservative side. Listen, I don't think the direction of what we're seeing is any different than what we've seen since we all first started talking about ESG and as a company making commitments. I mean, one of the things that I, I get to do as a bank CEO is testify in front of Congress, um, uh, which it's kind of like a, you know, once a year or so, you got to have it on your calendar, and it's just the responsibility that you have. Uh, and if you go back and you look through those hearings, you always had people on the right side of the aisle questioning what we were doing, why we were doing it, whether it was politicized or not, what was driving it, and things like that. Um, I think the reality is when we think about what we do, um, first of all, again, we think about the broad range of stakeholders in terms of who we're here to satisfy. Um, but at the same time, we have shareholders that, that, that vote. And so, you know, let's not forget the fact that when our board sits around and decides what we think the right thing to do is, we do have to take into account those that are going that, that, that to vote on proposals and make sure that we're considering their point of views on these things. That's not considering the p political point of view. That's considering the shareholder point of view and how they're thinking about it relative to the way Roger described let me ask you, uh, we're gonna, I want to open it up for questions in just a moment, and I would probably bring it back to the economy. But I, I, I have one more for you, Charlie, which is uh, you took this job in 2019 uh, at a time when the Wells Fargo uh, name, in truth, I think uh, was a, a challenged name. There were, uh, and, and again, that may be polite. It was something that was in the headlines constantly, uh, billions of dollars in fines that had been paid uh, for all sorts of things. I'm so curious what you thought had happened when you think about the culture that was before you, what you learned during this period, and where you think you are on that journey with the public. Sure. I think, um, listen, I think uh, 
when we look back at our journey, uh, I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. We were coming out of the financial crisis. We were one of the strongest and most respected financial institutions, not just in the U.S., but in the world. Um, and I think for very, very good reason. When you look at what we've done for individuals, for businesses, for communities, the support that we provided, um, it was very, very well earned. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, it takes a very long time to build that kind of reputation and a very short time to lose that reputation. Um, we lost sight of the details of what was required uh, for us to run an institution of the size and complexity of ours. So post Dodd-Frank, there were whole, it was very clear what additional uh, measures you had to put in place to make sure that the company is well controlled. Um, and we did not do that as well as we should have. Uh, and we saw that we did things to consumers that we should have never done. Um, and so, having said that, when I was called about the job, because we, you, know, you and I have talked about this, I, was at, I just joined uh, Bank of New York Mellon a, a year or so before that. I had no intention of leaving. Um, it was a place that I thought I would end my career at. The people are wonderful. It's a truly interesting franchise. And when I was called about this, um, after a lot of deliberation, I said to my, I thought, listen, this is, Wells is an incredibly important institution for this country. You know, when you look at the 60 million consumers that we do business with, the, you know, what we do, again, in local communities, the things that we support, um, the best thing, uh, if I really wanted to make a difference at this, towards the tail end of my career, there was no better place to do it than Wells, because I believe that it was, it absolutely was fixable. I thought that it was, uh, uh, it was clear the work that had to get done. Um, and I would feel incredibly rewarded to be able to bring Wells back to the reputation that it had. Now, it does, doesn't mean we're going to be the biggest bank in the country. It doesn't mean that we're going to be in every last thing that we do. Um, but it is putting those things behind us. And unfortunately, they've got very long tails. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to do this. Uh, but we're moving forward, and I feel very good about the people that we have at the company across the board to get this done. Fair enough. Um, let's, uh, let's open this up uh, for questions, because I know there's probably a lot uh, of them. I see, um, and we have, where, where do we have mics in the back on this side? Um, since he's close to you and he's got an uh, ideas hat on, why don't you uh, bring him a microphone? Hi, for both of you, thank you for the presentation. And my, my question really um, is when I look at what's happened with banking and with COVID and the closure of all the branches, and that was just the, kind of the beginning of a technological wave. And now I see what's going to happen with AI. And just a client that I have at Amazon that's a senior engineer, had 400 engineers below him last September. Now he's down to 80 because generative AI is so much better at coding. So my question to both of you is, obviously, it's going to create incredible excitement and opportunity. I think it's also going to cause a tremendous amount of lack of need for employees. So how do you see that going forward as the implication for the economy uh, and for your businesses? A dislocation question. So let me start by saying um, whenever we see these massive technological moves, it creates a great deal of anxiety for lots of good reasons because it does mean some things that we used to do don't have to be done anymore. But the great sweep of technology and the economy has been positive. Technological innovation has generally led to more productivity, you know, going back to the plow even earlier. It has gotten rid of some jobs but created new jobs, many of which are unimaginable. Um, and so I think with respect to generative AI, among other things, there will be some regulatory issues or some, uh, some other issues over time, not week to week, quarter to quarter, we will look back, or our children look back and say, this generative AI revolution that's sort of gotten started in 2022, 2023, has proven to make us a much more productive economy, some new jobs that didn't exist before, some old things that used to exist we don't do anymore. The transition could be painful for some people, but count me more technologically optimistic than negative. Charlie, though, let, uh, let's put meat on the bones on that. You guys do projections uh, with your board about what's hiring going to look like, you know, 12 months out, 24 months out. Have you had, is, is AI part of that conversation in terms of what your employee base and, and, and the physical number of people that are employed that have Wells Fargo, uh, you know, checks every two weeks? Yeah, we've ab absolutely started the conversation. In fact, we had a regular board meeting yesterday and we, and, and we talked about it. I think, I think just being very, very practical about it is it's going to take 
this is not something which is going to happen immediately and all of a sudden there are going to be mass displacements across all types of firms of all sizes, et cetera. I think, um, I think generative AI is extremely interesting. I think it's incredibly important that companies and individuals do everything they can to learn about what the capabilities are. But it's also, uh, the risks are also very significant. And I think you're going to see some people who are going to be early adopters. You're going to see a series of mistakes made. But I think most large companies are going to be very controlled about how they release something out into the public. And what we're going to find, like we've, I mean, just the same way we found with all of the other uh, advancements, whether, whether it's the internet, whether it's email, whether it's texting, all the things that people do either in their individual lives or in businesses, it's going to get filled with the ability to do something more. And so the way we think about it, and as we think about what these things are, is absolutely there's some jobs that are going to go away. But at the same time, it also creates, we're thinking about the things that we'll be able to do in the future, not just the things we'll be able to do with less people, but the additional things we'll be able to do with our customers that we're not able to, to do today. And that's going to require people, and that's going to require talent to think about how to use it. And so what we're just starting to think about is how do we, evolve our workforce from what it looks like today to what it needs to look like in the future. You know, there's a microphone on this side. Why don't we try to, try to bring it around this side? And then I know there was a gentleman all the way in the back. We'll, we'll get to you, I promise. You're, you're in the cheap seats, and uh, those are going to be even better seats by the time we get the microphone to you, I promise. Just going back to SVB, SVB and the bank failures, my question is, should all financial institutions be mandated to abandon the whole maturity accounting entirely and move, move to market-to-market to mark, to market accounting to keep bank risk tape from, from getting out of control. The run on SVB seemed to, be, uh, seemed to have occurred after analysts showed the mark-to-market valuations showed that they were insolvent and, and was behind the run. Who wants to take that? And, and just to break that question down a little bit, I think, sir, uh, is the, is the issue of, of how banks, quote unquote, mark to market, uh, mark to mark their, their, their assets on a potentially daily basis, meaning what's everything worth today, uh, versus things that you're going to be holding for, say, 10 years, uh, in which case you're not necessarily marking it day to day. And one of the reasons that the Silicon Valley Bank had so many problems was because so much of their balance sheet was, in fact, not being marked on a day to day basis. Is that a, is that a, that's a very basic version of what happened, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess. I, th I think the issue is there's got to be, again, what I said before, I think there's got to be more comprehensive liquidity risk management across the institutions. Held to maturity exists for, I mean, we have a long debate about it, but it exists for a reason. It exists because um, we, I mean, we do make loans on one side of the balance sheet, which are multi-year loans. And so that loan doesn't get marked to market. And so to have a deposit on the other side that funds that with the same duration, you've got to be careful about creating this inequity that exists. But the fact that we do mark HTM, at least and disclose what it is, gives people the ability to do, to do their own work and analysis. What's most important in my mind is we take those pieces, and those are two pieces that are part of a much bigger puzzle, which is our balance sheet. And the question is, are we effectively interest rate, you know, managing the interest rate risk and the liquidity risk um, that exists in that entire balance sheet? And again, I think the answer is for some institutions, absolutely. And for others, not at all. And those are the holes that have to be dealt with in future regulation. Can I just ask a quick follow-up to that, which is there's a, a lot of talk about the shadow banking system uh, around how people get loans uh, today. Um, you know, the mortgage business, most of the big banks have actually tried to get out of the mortgage business. You'll still offer a mortgage, of course, but um, that's not really where most people are offering mortgages because it's not a great business. Um, some of the big private equity firms have transformed themselves to become, uh, to loan money uh, to corporations, uh, companies like Apollo. And, and, and you could argue that, and I'm curious what you think of this, those firms are effectively raising money saying, you give us the money, and the duration is going to be 10 years. And by the way, we're only loaning money for 10 years. And so the duration is, is matched completely, and, and meaning nobody's ever getting their money back in the middle of the 10 years. That's actually, that may be a better model to some degree when it comes to making loans than the model of the banking system, given that here we all are thinking that if we put a deposit in our bank, we can get the money at any moment on our, on our phone. 
So uh, your point is certainly well taken. A reason that we have to regulate banks is they do exactly what you're talking about, or what Charlie is talking about. Uh, it's got a fancy name of transformation, uh, maturity transformation, interest rate transformation, a bunch of transformations. But the issue ultimately is that banks take in money from individuals primarily and promise to give it back the next day. And at the same time, they make loans that might not mature for 10, 20, or in the old days, 30 years. What works in these alternative markets is that there's no guarantee of anyone getting their money back anytime soon. It allows those institutions to operate without as much regulatory oversight. You know, the amount of capital that they have, one can debate. I happen to think that the American system is stronger because we have both of these. I spend a lot of my time in Europe. It's purely bank-centric. They've got a, a different set of problems. So I would be – I'm much more comfortable with what we have now – private money moving into places where a regulated entity wouldn't want to do it, and they have to manage themselves knowing that, indeed, people aren't going to lend them money if they don't have a high degree of trust and confidence in them. And, Andrew, I just want to just correct one thing, Please. which is they're not perfectly matched because these firms, right. they, they leverage them. I mean, yes. these, they're not 100% yes. equity financed. Correct. There, there's a lot of leverage embedded in these transactions, which is why they make the money they make in, right. in many of the instances. Fair enough. Uh, we, pro we promised the gentleman in, all the way in the back uh, that we'd get him a microphone, so let's, let's do that if we could. I actually had a, a bank regulatory question that uh, was, I think, taken by the gentleman further up. So oh. I'm going to ask a different question. Go for it. Um, with, when, you, when, when I look at what's happening around the world, we have a rising middle class in Africa. We have uh, a large population in, in India. Of course, we have increasing economic power, wealth, rising population in China. Um, it's pretty clear that it, in order for us to compete on the world stage, we need to ensure that everyone in this country is participating as, as much as possible in the economic system. Um, however, with the, the uh, changes in technology, the pace of change, it seems as if uh, there's the potential for more people to be left behind. So my question is from an education standpoint, what can our education system do to ensure that uh, everyone has an opportunity to take full fully in, in our economic system so that we actually have enough people so that we can participate and actually compete globally. We're going to have to do a second panel. Go for it. All right, so let me start with, um, factually, what you're saying has is, is certainly been true. If one thinks about the sweep of um, income and wealth inequality in this country, it started roughly in 1975, call it 1980. We started to see a real gap uh, in income and wealth inequality. Unfortunately, it's been made worse during many of the crises for a variety of reasons. To your point, um, I believe for us to compete, yes, education is important. One of the reasons I'm a technology optimist is I think that is part of the solution for sure. To your broader point, if we don't figure out how to fix this income and wealth inequality uh, challenge uh, with the haves and have-nots, and by the way, wealth inequality now is about as bad as it's been since the Gilded Age, and it was obviously very, very bad then, I am somewhat concerned, more than somewhat concerned, that we will f f uh, confront more of the kinds of political schisms that we've seen. And so your point, I think, goes very much to, one, why we come to this discussion, but two, what people in this room should be thinking about, which is how do we bring the society back together? And I think it starts with handling income and wealth inequality in a way that hopefully we can coalesce around as being you know, consistent with American values. I, gr I agree with what Roger said, but i just deal with the education question for a second because you know, I think about this a little bit like diversity in our institution which is we don't have enough diversity in these large companies, and how do, we have to, how do we deal with it? Which is we make sure we're recognizing people internally. We figure out if there are uh, – where it's appropriate to bring people in from the outside. But ultimately, we need to build a much bigger base of people that have the same opportunity that everyone else has to advance. Okay, and I think when we look at educate, I mean, so we look at this issue, we've got to look at the existing issues that, that, that are just the facts of the disparities in wealth. But, we, but the education issue is just at the heart of solving the problem from the very beginning, which is there is no real financial education in this country. I mean, it, it means just, I mean if you just think about it for I mean, how, I mean, 
whatever school you went to, grammar school, middle school, high school, whatever it is, name the class that you took where you were really advised on how to deal with your own personal finances in a very meaningful way. And we see it when we start uh, uh, the things that we're doing around the country as well as Fargo to try and get a broader community access to the banking system, we realize that we don't have direct access to all these populations. They don't trust banks necessarily, so we partner with third parties, a lot of CDFIs that are very, very local. And when you go and meet these CDFIs and you see what they're doing, they're providing the education for people that was never provided before. And so at some point, there does need to be, across the entire country, at all levels, mandatory financial education. Great place to end this conversation. Charlie Scharf and Roger Ferguson, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for your questions, everybody. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.